coming today. Uh, my name is Mike Skelton. I'm with the uh, Richardson Economic Development uh, Partnership here in Richardson. And I'm one of the, um, uh, the uh, leaders of the U.S. Ignite project we have going on here. I, I recognize some of you from the last uh, event that we had in February. So I want to welcome you back, and I want to welcome the new people who have not been here before to our event. Um, this won't be a long event. I know we, we blocked out about three hours this afternoon, but basically we'll, we'll go through the presentation. It'll take maybe 45 minutes or maybe a, an hour, depending on the pace. And then we're going to open it up for questions from you in the audience in terms of what questions you might have if you're interested in um, developing an application for our, our challenge. Um, we'll try to answer as many of those questions you have and where you can go to find more information should you do uh, want to work on this at a later date. Um, okay, so we're going we're to start off today. There's just two of us presenting today. Um, and again, uh, we're happy to have you here in the, in the area. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce a couple of the members of my team um, that are that kind of help manage the process of the U.S. program. This is kind of a, right now, this is an agenda of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, there's there's a general uh, agenda on your on your table there that we left uh, printed copies of, but um, the the, the um, Richardson Internet uh, Inter uh, the Richardson Community Internet uh, Use Ignite Initiative was uh, a partnership between the Economic Development uh, Partnership of Richardson and UT Dallas, and as you as you'll hear today from one of the members of UT Dallas technical staff. This is, this is a unique situation for U.S. Ignite. Typically, it's a city in the United States that has been a, become a member, and we're the only joint partnership to join U.S. Ignite. We were one of the, tw I think we were the 12th organization to join three years ago. There are now 25 cities. We'll explain that a little bit later also. The, uh, the people that I want to recognize, now George Brody's not here today, but George is a senior telecom executive that sits on our panel of um, leadership, leadership panel. Um, Don Hicks was here today. Don, will you raise your hand? He's uh, with the University of Texas at Dallas, uh, one of our uh, leaders as well in the program. Helped me put this together and got the university involved in it. Uh, Frank Fegans, who's the uh, VP and CIO at UT Dallas, who's not here today, but uh, uh, the gentleman that's got all the, all the brain power for this project is here in his place, so Giovanna, who is the, uh, the uh, director of um, Inter Enterprise, what is the official title? Uh, director of Enterprise Architect. Yeah, Director of Enterprise Architect, that's correct. Uh, and then I, I want to also introduce Ed Hightower, who sits on our panel as well. So those gentlemen are here in, in the audience. If you have any questions you want to ask them about the program or we're, we're networking or after the presentation, feel free to do so. The last event we had, I want to just bring a couple of contributors up here today. Is that uh, I want to thank the Eisman Center for hosting us today. They're, they're, as a member of the Richardson Economic Development, we work closely with the Eisman Center, and they've been able to uh, make us uh, the space available for our presentation today. But uh, there was a there was a group of people that on the last uh, challenge we had in February that had donated some equipment that we're in the process right now of getting installed on UTD campus that could be used if you have some ideas about how to use that equipment for one of your application proposals. Uh, Annexter, a big distributor of, of things like uh, uh, the equipment of, of uh, smart cities, was one of the sponsors along with iWire 365, who was one of their installers and resellers who uh, managed this project uh, for the university. So those, I want to just give them some, uh, some kudos here while, while we have a chance. Um, you know, I, the big question is, uh, everybody's been pushing for a gigabit community. That seems that smart cities, all that kind of thing. I just wanted to kind of make sure everybody kind of understands what that's all about. You know, um, uh, what is a, gig, a, big, a gigabit community? It's, it's where you have 100% coverage. Every building has connectivity to uh, broadband uh, technology, internet, um, and end-to-end um, -end connectivity for the last mile, <coughs> last 100 feet. Uh, that, that's really what a gigabit city is all about. There isn't one in the whole United States. There's a few, few communities that are moving in that direction. I think Chattanooga is probably the closest uh, community in the, in the country that has put 
gigabit connectivity to almost all the buildings in their community. They have 175,000 people uh, population, and most of the buildings and most of the people are connected. But I think they're the only one in the United States that can say that. Now, everybody else is trying to get to there, and uh, so it, it means that you've got to have affordable connectivity. You've got to have it access, you know, uh, accessible. And the big uh, internet providers are slowly moving in that direction. But uh, it's going to take demand to make them do it. And these programs that we're doing at US Ignite are to create the demand for such um, connectivity. So that's what this is all about, creating the demand to put in the kind of, of internet connectivity for uh, the future that we need to have. Just a, just as a bit of comparison here in terms of you, you can see what what does a gigabit connectivity mean to somebody? And I wanted to just share this with you a little bit. You can see on this chart that um, you know the number of high high definition movies that can be streamed uh, in a gigabit, and it says what here two hundred and eight. Um, uh, streams versus broadband, which is what you typically have in your house today, of maybe one and two thirds of a, of a movie could be streamed at the same amount of time. So you can see that the difference in the, the amount of, um, of data movement that you can have with a gigabit versus just broadband with today's connectivity. The other uh, example is that of, um, Let's see here, how, how much of a 60 minute video could be uploaded to YouTube in 10 minutes? On broadband, it's about 20%, and with gigabit, you can have 222 uh, uploads. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's quite, a, quite a difference. And then down in the bottom there is that um, if you were to back up your 800 gigabit computer, how long would it take? On broadband, it would take, uh, gosh, uh, 14 minutes. You only get a percentage of that, and in that case, in this particular case, you would get. It's hard for me to see, but I think it says you could get all of it done in uh, 14 minutes, something like that. So, the, the comparisons of broadband versus gigabit connectivity is immense. So, we're looking for the applications that can utilize this kind of broadband, uh, this kind of uh, technology. To, to give us the internet of the future. And, and that would equate to uh, some of the benefits to municipal governments and federal agencies, but things like um, uh, smart fire and disaster, uh, smart police and security, uh, smart transportation, smart energy, smart grid, smart water management, all these kind of things can be done with this kind of technology, but there, we haven't created those applications yet. And we're looking for the communities around the country to kind of step forward and, and have the local entrepreneurs come up with these kind of activities uh, to create these applications. And, and hopefully that will drive the implementation of, of, of the uh, gigabit um, broadband. So just basically, um, US Ignite was a program launched in 2011. It's a National Science Foundation project and now it's become a program. So it's officially part of the National Science Foundation. And the, the areas of focus that they're really looking on is the, the six, one, the six uh, items listed here, healthcare, education and workforce, public safety, transportation, advanced manufacturing, and engineering. Now there may be others that w could utilize the same type of technology, but those are their focus areas. And US Ignite wanted in five years to create 60 applications and get 200 community test bits participating. So we're a little behind that in terms of the number of participants and, and applications. But I'll show you here what we've done in, in Richardson in the last uh, three years. It's very impressive. What it's all about, they, they talk about a locavore infrastructure. That means typically locavore more you eat what you produce right here in your local community. So basically what this uh, analogy is is that we want to produce these applications here locally, but use the Genie network to share these with other communities around the country to get more exposure for the applications. Um, one of the things I'm going to emphasize here today is that we're looking for you to create applications, you the community, to create applications. You will own those applications. We just want to promote them and help you uh, get exposure for them, not only here in our community, but across the country. 
So whatever you de develop, you own the IP. What we will ask you to do, though, if you're part of this program and do take some money from us as, this, as a winner, is that you share your, your, um, your application with US Ignite over their network for at least two years so other communities can play with it. Not, and, and it'll be done through whatever license agreement you want to do, but basically, <coughs> You own the IP, but we'd like you to share it so that other communities can see it. What it gives to you is the benefit of getting exposure for your application to possible customers and clients around the country who might want to use it. So, um, what uh, what happened? We we joined um, in 2013. We joined US Ignite along with uh, UT Dallas, uh, and at that time we were the 12th one. I mentioned that earlier. We've, at the university, they've created five applications that uh, kind of fit the model of US Ignite under this US, pro, US Ignite program, but they were separate grants that were uh, developed by the uh, staff there, the researchers there. We've received, since the last time we met, our Genie Rack, and it is now installed in G. Vanio, is going to explain what we have at our uh, availability here uh, for you to, to use as part of your development. And the next thing we're working on is developing what's called a to uh, digital town square, where we're able to bring in all the internet providers into a single uh, source so that we can start spreading this technology out to all parts of the, of the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Okay, so here are some of the, the applications that have been developed. Now, I'm gonna show you seven applications, a couple of which are not necessarily UT Dallas developed, but they're part of our uh, local community that have, have provided a US Ignite application. Um, the first one here is, is a geolocated allergen sensing platform called GASP. Uh, Dr. David Lowry at UT Dal Dallas has developed this. And basically what he's come up with is, this is a big data analytics uh, application that's gonna require a lot of processing power. <coughs> Collecting sensor information from around the community analyzing it and being able to predict where there's going to be problems with uh, pollution and, al and allergens and things of that nature so that he can send application notices through cell phones to people who have those uh, 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 allergies to those things so they can prevent going into certain areas of a community based upon the information he's collected. I believe that he's now working with uh, Chattanooga on implementing this as part of their US Ignite project there, so because they have a complete network of, of um, sensors throughout the city that they're going to um, put into play. So that's, that's, that's one of the first applications we had. Then we had Dr. Fumagalli, who has developed an industrial cloud robotics across <laughs> software-defined networks. <coughs> Basically what this is, is being able to remotely control and, and access uh, manufacturing <coughs> equipment from a distance, so that you have instantaneous um, control and there's no latency in, in what you're working on. He demonstrated at uh, the US Ignite project uh, program down in Austin last uh, fall where he was um, in Austin connected to UT Dallas, connected to somewhere in UT, uh, somewhere in uh, down in uh, was it San Antonio? The, the robot was in, in uh, Tokyo. San Antonio. And we have a server in Japan, and we have a server in UT Dallas, okay. and we remotely control that tool. Long story short, it was a long ways away, and he was able to control it from, from the demonstration site down in Austin, and uh, show that you could have a, it was a, it was a tool that was designed to do a bit of uh, planing on, on a, a piece of a material. Surface. Surface planing, conditioning and he was able to control that remotely over the internet through that. So it shows the ability of, of having high-speed networks with low latency handling uh, advanced manufacturing situations, control of advanced manufacturing equipment. Uh, the third one is one that um, has been put on hold until we get our genie rack operating, but it basically uh, it's remote physical therapy with haptic feedback. Now this was a project that was granted a, a, a um, NSF grant for, uh, to uh, Prava. How do you, I don't know how you pronounce his last name, uh, but uh, basically what it was is that working with the Veterans Hospital here in Dallas, having people do um, physical therapy on machines where you could get the feedback from 
a remote location on the street and the uh, movement that they were doing at that location, physical therapy. So it's remote physical therapy training, things of that nature. So you can see that's another application for this technology. Um, we're also working right now with UT Southwestern on doing something with the Da Vinci robotic surgery machine. And that would be able to do remote surgery. As you know, as you may or may not know, is that a Da Vinci machine is a, is a mechanical device that's very accurate and can do some very uh, unique types of surgery. And the person doing the operating is not next to the patient, he's in a room someplace. So theoretically, that person could be in a room across the country or you know, across the city doing the same kind of surgery through, through the uh, device. And that's what this kind of network technology would be able to do. So we're in the process of working with UT Southwestern and UT Dallas on, on um, uh, making that a reality. Um, now, on the last, on the last challenge we had in February, Dr. Zilke at UTD um, did a proposal that they would do a virtual reality patient system application in Modem. Mm -hmm. And basically what that is, they, they were using Microsoft HoloLenses to create, and they created uh, avatars or, or virtual people <coughs> with all kinds of, of, of emotive or facial expressions or movements or things of that nature that were captured and put into this, this um, avatar uh, in a virtual per patient. And um, they, they placed the patient into a room. So it would be like having the patient sitting right there and you could ask them questions. So they showed us a demonstration of that about uh, three weeks ago. And so they've, been, they've received the second part of their, their, um, of their award of $10,000 for showing the demonstration. Um, and um, that was another uh, one of the applications that had been developed. There's another group from, uh, uh, actually from uh, U University of North Texas, um, and then also UT Arlington working together on a device that would be used in a communications uh, emergency where they'd have to put a <coughs> drone in the air to act as a cell point for communications should there be that down power lines and things of that nature, down telephone poles. Uh, and uh, so they, they've been demonstrating that for UT, uh, for the USC Ignite program for several years at their events. And so they're, they're one of the community people here that have put together a USC Ignite application. <coughs> and then finally, we're working on the second winner of the February uh, challenge, which is security on the, on the uh, streetlights. Uh, <coughs> so basically, um, um, is Mr. Prasad, he's here, Dr. Prasad, he's here. Yeah, he's here today. We're in the process right now of getting the equipment from the um, vendor to put on the campus to get it tested out so he can get his um, second half of the, of the award. We hope to do that first of the year. So uh, we're working on that hopefully with, with G here. So those are examples of the kinds of, of technology that has been already developed here in North Texas area that uh, kind of give you an example of what could be done with uh, this technology. So with that, I'd like to turn, turn it over to G, who's going to tell you a little bit about what we now have at UTD avail available for, the, uh, for this project and for the community outside of this project. Should you have other things you're working on that you want to test out on this equipment, you can, you can apply for us to get time on the Genie Rack and the sort of equipment that we have at UT Dallas to test out your applications apart from what we're trying to do here today with this, with this uh, challenge. So, G, you want to come up and, and uh, give them a little preview? Thank you for coming out today. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm the interface between uh, the Dallas and the U.S. Ignite program um, on the technical side at the moment. Um, so, I just want to give you an update on what's going on, um, what resources are there. We have a campus network. Um, data center uh, over the last three or four months of Genie Rack. Um, our Genie Rack connects to advanced research, national level research networks across the country um, through the Internet 2 network provided by the Learn Group. Um, we have a lot of research on the campus in technology and uh, open flow and software defined networking um, that all of those things can be used in the Genie Rack. Um, 
So if your application that you're working on requires something more than, than what you can get today, if you require extra bandwidth or if you require a certain level of latency that the internet just doesn't give you today, this is a place where you can test out things like that. Um, along the way, besides the Genie Rack, over this past six months or so, we were able to repurpose a lot of the um, Stampede supercomputer from TAC into UT Dallas. Um, so that we did a, a proof of concept pilot of that. We were able to get 400 compute nodes um, basically for free. Um, not free as in beer, free as in puppy, because there does take work and it does take resources. But it did work out. So those computational resources have become available to the researchers at UT Dallas and to the students. Um, since that worked out well, we're getting 800 more of those. That's that's pretty a significant compute resource. So if your application requires processing that you want to offload to the cloud or that you want to put somewhere else, <coughs> we have the ability to, to help you with that. Uh, here's the same picture from last year, from well, earlier this year. Um, and you can kind of see a, a typical network structure. Um, yeah, in the left-hand corner, uh, you have an internet connection, and kind of the UTD border, and the learn network, the internet, and then these advanced research networks. And this way, you know, here's a person goes through an access layer, distribution, core network router, and then off to these research networks. And then on the other side, you have a sort of a mirror image of that at the other. Uh, smart gigabit communities, um, especially the ones that do, in fact, have a genie rack. So what's different about that is you can make guarantees. Um, since I, UTD controls everything over here, um, Learn, our, our partner, controls this. This is out of our control, commodity internet. All of this, though, is still within our control, so we can make guarantees on bandwidth. We can make guarantees on latency of connections. So if you have a DaVinci machine um, and you're trying to you know, do remote surgery from one site to another, <coughs> that network better work and it better offer you a guaranteed latency or somebody's going to get hurt. So that's, that's the kind of thing that you know, would be new and would be <coughs> an amazing use of technology. Um, one of the applications that has been long lived in the, in the smart gigabit communities is called Lola. And it's the ability to have a, a concert with the participants in different locations. So maybe you have a world class violinist at UTD, and maybe you have a world class pianist at UCSD in San Diego, and you want them to have a concert. But you can't risk flying them because they're that valuable. You can't fly them together. Uh, that's one way to have that concert. Or maybe you just have some high school students and their friends are in another location. They want to have a concert. Try to do that today over the internet. It doesn't work so well because of these latencies, the way it works. Well, in the future, you'll be able to do things like that it's because the networks will have gotten to that point of performance. So when you think about new applications, especially gigabit, low latency, those are the kinds of thoughts that come to mind, at least for a lot of technologists, is what can we do that we can't do today? What can we do better than we're doing today? Um, if you, I'm, in terms of networking, I'm really good with that. In terms of computation, I'm really good with that. So if you have questions about that, uh, please do, do inquire. Genie, different genie sites. This is still the same map from about six months ago, although this is a little bit outdated now. There are five new uh, smart gigabit communities and more genie racks out there. Um, this is kind of a little technical explanation of some of the resources that we have available. Ganymede is a high-performance computing environment. Um, we have half a petabyte of storage there available, and it's about 28% utilized at the moment. Uh, we have the brand new Genie Rack there. It's got five compute nodes in it, where three of them can be repurposed in, in the Genie environment. You get a graphical interface, and you 
plop a resource on there, like a Windows machine or a Linux machine, put some connectors in there for the networking. So some of this might be at UT Dallas, and then some might be at another Genie site. Uh, let's say NCSA in Champaign. So you, you draw what you want, you push a button, and then the system goes out and builds that for you dynamically. So 10 minutes later, you know what you wanted is, is there, and you can start to run experiments over that infrastructure. And so it's convenient. So three of those three of those five computers are for virtual machines in there, and then two are for bare metal. So for example, maybe you're doing some research <coughs> and you need your own Linux machine. You need full 100% control over every aspect of it. Those two machines are for that purpose. Um, those old stampede nodes that we talked about, there's just some, some numbers there of resources that we have that we can uh, if it makes sense, we can let you use them, proof of concept, or maybe a year or two of production work with your application. I would say that the biggest thing, all, all of that is sort of technical work that's just taking place, but give me one second. The biggest thing for us is that we haven't done a really good job over the last year of supporting the, the NSF US Ignite effort, and we know that. Um, the priorities of the UT Dallas administration, the CIO and the president, number one is research, supporting research. So we're retooling the whole entire OIT department around these five, five critical things, student support, research, and the other three. So in my area, which is research computing, uh, we're getting ready to add four new positions there. So even in doing this presentation, I struggle with having the time to make a better presentation. I should, shouldn't have to struggle that quite that hard. I, I owe uh, Dr. Prasad uh, an apology for not, not moving faster on his work. He's been waiting for me you know, for quite a while. So we're gonna, we're gonna fix that to make us more agile and more able to do research and support <coughs> efforts like this by adding these people. Um, so I expect that over the next six months it'd be quite different. And UT Dallas becoming a tier one research university, we need to be agile like that and be able to, when a researcher has a good idea, help them with it and not let it languish for six months. So that, out of all of this, that's probably the biggest change, certainly the most expensive change going on. So I'm excited about that. And I'll uh, turn it back to you. Okay. So the, the goal for this challenge is to create two new applications that take advantage of, as, you, as you've heard, gigabit internet bandwidth, low latency, uh, or a <coughs> combination of both using software-defined networking and OpenFlow. So this, this is, a, again, a, a replication of our last challenge, and there'll be two winners we'll pick. So um, we'll go through the, the rules, guidelines, and regulations next so that you understand what it's all about. Yeah, I, ba you know, basically, the equipment that we're going to be putting on the campus is really a smart street light that has some capabilities. And I thought maybe you might want to address that in terms of what uh, what we plan to do with that. Sure. Part of the effort as well at UTD, um, as we've recently become a tier one research university, is to have multiple test beds for all this research that's going on. Um, so you can see an example here where the street lights have some Wi-Fi gear on them and they can communicate and there may be a camera there, maybe an app. Um, there's some other efforts going on right now with some grant writing where the street light might also contain LIDAR. So um, if a cyclist is here or a pedestrian is here and a car is coming down like this, uh, it's not a good thing. It happens. So we like to warn people to watch out for that kind of stuff. So all these test beds for various things, everything, an example like that, um, an example where there's low energy Bluetooth uh, sensors and um, beacons 
in different physical locations or going in um, to do all sorts of experiments. Um, that's not there today. It's uh, several of those are going out right now, but as more time goes on, I, th I foresee UTD becoming much more of a research testbed kind of an environment uh, with, with so much um, to do about the Internet of Things. There's so much to do about a gigabit, smart gigabit community. You've got to have a place to kind of test this out and see if it's going to fly and then build something even better. And so, again, the, the priority out of the OIT department and from the higher administration <coughs> is to become just that. Uh, so there's serious efforts in that. Um, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, these, these frequencies here um, are one thing. At the same time, you know, I know there's research going on at UT with millimeter wave 60 gigahertz systems that have a huge bandwidth. Um, so even, you know, the difference between the time when this slide was made versus what's going on today there with the research is dramatic. And it's going to hopefully continue to be uh, that way. Uh, here's an example, potentially where we're, again, we're monitoring the road and how this would work out. It's got industrial outdoor Wi-Fi and cameras. We're able to monitor what's going on here. Um, it's part of a test bed. We have several other test beds that are in production at the moment. Uh, so in that application, uh, could you touch a little bit on the height and the gigahertz speed, latency, or SGM? What, what, what are we using there? How, how are we uh, leveraging that? Well, a test bed, obviously, if you're doing a smart city type of an environment, you're going to have these things spread all over the place. A test bed is only a, a, a part of that to give you, give you some segment of of maybe it's not full gigabit, but it tells you if you were to deploy this and you need a gigabit of bandwidth, here's how it worked in a, in a test bit situation. Given a, given a test bit situation, how it would work if you were to expand it, basically what I'm saying. So it gives you a chance to test out some of the things, knowing that as, as you deploy more of them, you have more data flow, you'll have more need for, for, for low latency. It's and you just kind of extrapolate that to come up with what you're talking about from a larger implementation. Yeah, but a little, little later, you can see, like you know, you were saying that we can compute in real time about a vehicle being on a pedestrian or a bicycle road, so that that person can be immediately warned or informed, and that requires low latency. Yeah. And when when you look here and you see that they, at the bottom here they have each pole and they specify the equipment that's going with it. So you can see they have certain kinds of lighting going on there, certain kinds of wireless. Uh, the second pole, same thing, lighting and wireless. The third one, lighting, more wireless. So if you think about that, what are they going to do? I don't see, on, in this particular example, um, cameras in there at the moment. So to me, they're going to be controlling this lighting, basically, which is going to save them power. They're going to pay for this over the course of three years, just from the power savings or better control of that. If you multiply this by the size of Dallas, the cost savings is enormous, and you know there'll be full-time positions created to to make this happen across you know a city the size of Dallas. That's a big deal. So that's the kind of one of the kinds of things that they look at. Uh, Gene, oh. quick question <coughs> on the applications you tested. Can you share with us? You say low latency. What kind of latency do you test it against? Is it microseconds, milliseconds? Uh, the test that I'm <coughs> most familiar with, um, and I, I really can't answer that at the moment, but the, the most interesting stuff that, that I'm aware of at the moment has to do with uh, the latency involved in autonomous vehicle driving and also 5G wireless. That latency has to be extremely, extremely short to keep up with the processing uh, capability. So the researchers have they have measured this um, to know, 
from pole to pole, what is, you're going to have a wireless unit there, and those wireless units go back to either an edge computer there or back to the central. And your device, your car is going through there, and it's got multiple antennas and multiple, just like a lot of the cell phones do today, just a lot more. There's a lot of capability there where 5G or phone has a 10 gig connection. I mean, that's significantly different than today. Mm -hmm. How do you make that happen? You have to have those radios talking and communicating and agreeing and cooperating. So to do that requires very low latency. Um, autonomous vehicle, if the latency is too high, you have a collision. Right. So stuff like that. Um, yeah. Did you actually use um, gigabit wireless on, on these street lights? I mean, do you have, I don't know if it's a, like, yeah. like a Wi-Fi modem or, I mean, how are you guys so, emulating it? Are you making your own software to find kind of stuff, your own transmitters? Is it kind of like a private thing or producing commercially available off the shelf kind of stuff? For equipment? So today, this is getting ready to go in. It's not in play. Um, we're hoping to have these test beds in the next three to four months fully functional. Um, that way, this particular example, so it's hard for me to answer that it is, in this case, it is commercial equipment. Okay. And it's not, in fact, it says here what the specifications are mm -hmm. right on the first line. That's an industrial strength <coughs> Wi-Fi solution. It's not like something you can go to the store and buy. Um, so it's going to have the characteristics of gigabit Ethernet and stop at that point. We look at stuff like that, but we have in, on the research side, we also look at a lot of software to find control of this environment so that we can make it even better, go beyond what the manufacturer did with it. Because if we can do that, that's a big deal to the, the people that are using it, plus the people who made it. Get, if you get more value out of by doing this research and applying it to it, it's worth some serious money to do that. So we look at things like that. Um, the other, the, the numbers on the 5G and the autonomous driving in terms of latency requirements of that, and even, even the remote surgery, those are uh, analytical models today with some experimentation behind them to show that that's correct. So mm -hmm. those are research topics and they're in development, so they're, I can't point to a standard and say this is the number, um, but it's it's headed that way. So is there gonna be like a test bed or some place where we can do that? I guess so, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so go back up to the slide just before this one. This is the um, equipment that Annexter has promised to give to us to test out. What they were looking for was a place to install a, a, a test bed that they could not only prove that this stuff works, but also bring their customers in to see how it would work in their particular situation. So we've agreed that if they donate it, we'll give them access to it to take their customers to and show how it works. And the whole concept is, they're just equipment. We need applications to make this stuff actually work. And that's why the, we're doing this particular type of uh, challenge. So yeah, well, well basically, let's, let's go back to that first slide there. So in, in this particular challenge to all of you here and to the community, and I want to make something uh, clear. Um, we're opening this up to the whole North Texas community. I, we thank you for coming. We hope that you consider giving us a uh, proposal based upon what we're going to show you in a minute. But, um, You've got till uh, the end of, almost the end of January to put a proposal together. So there'll be other people who can't make it to the event today that we're, we've videotaped it and it'll be up on the website. Or if you want to come back later and look at it to pick up some more information that maybe you missed while you were taking notes, you'll have access to that on the website. But the areas we're looking for, we don't care what, what kind of application you develop as long as it requires gigabit bandwidth, and at some point in the application, doesn't have to be always, but at, at peak period you need a gigabit, or low latency at some point that you need to, to have, uh, or create a, a software-defined network that employs uh, some of these aspects in the uh, routing of information through the network. 
Uh, those are the main criteria that you should consider for developing it. We had a challenge last time to use the equipment that uh, Dr. Prasad is going to be testing out with his application, and that's available to anybody else who wants to test out up for that equipment as well. So it's really kind of a smart campus type of environment that you could uh, use as a basis for your proposal. And these are the things that uh, you might be interested in doing that would use that equipment. Um, public safety, video surveillance, license plate recognition, facial recognition, traffic monitoring, um, emergency communication network and streaming video, parking space availability, apps, things of that nature. So those are some of the types of applications you might want to think about. Anything else that you can come up with would be great, but that's just some examples of that. So that equipment will be installed next quarter, maybe uh, by, by, by mid-year, but um, you've got to develop the applications, uh, the software to be employed on it, and we can give you the specifications for all the equipment to put into your application should you choose to use that equipment. The second thing is just basically any other application you want to come up with that, that uh, kind of fits into these categories that US Ignite is interested in. And the six categories are healthcare, uh, education, workforce development, public safety, transportation, advanced manufacturing, and energy. Those are the key things that US Ignite was focused on when they launched this program several years ago. And they're hoping to get more and more applications in those areas. We also have other. If there's something else that is a good public um, application for a smart city that doesn't fit those categories, we're still interested in it. So don't exclude it if you've got a good idea. Um, and again, those are the requirements that you might, might have to have to, uh, to, to do it. So you know, what are the benefits of, of participating? First of all, you get national exposure with your application. So if you're thinking about uh, commercializing this and making it a, uh, uh, making a company around this application, uh, we can give you some exposure to get you uh, customers, uh, perhaps uh, investors. Um, corporations might be interested in it. Um, certainly we'll do this through press releases and other things. Uh, we might even be able to get some video um, coverage on the news, local newscasts. Uh, they came down to talk about uh, doing it in the Smart Cities thing and, and I did a small, short, short uh, newscast with one of the reporters when we did the, uh, the last uh, challenge. Um, there are 25 cities in this program, so there are 25 cities that may want to replicate what you're doing in their city and, and one of the things I talked about earlier is that you, is if you're a winner, you've got to share your applications with, with the other cities. Not giving away your IP, you keep the IP, it's just that you license them to use it for a period of time. And it might be just that you, you're licensing the beta version or, the, or you know, the first products that you developed so they can test it out and be part of your beta, beta test program. Uh, and uh, once you get involved with this, there are chances for other, for other grants, uh, both from US Ignite and from National Science Foundation. I mentioned earlier that Marge Zilke, who at UT Dallas came up with the augmented reality application for patient uh, interviewing using the Microsoft HoloLens. She, she applied for a secondary grant from, from US Ignite and got another $10,000 for extending the application from what she gave to us to add another capability to it. And so the US Ignite people gave them another $10,000 to extend that application. So there's additional monies available from US Ignite should you get involved with this. Uh, and, and if you need any technical assistance, um, if you got questions, uh, US Ignite will make people available. Um, G is available, he's got some of his staff that can help out. Uh, and we can get other people that have um, volunteered some, some of their uh, expertise to put into the program. So if you need help on, on anything technical or, or anything else, uh, you, you call on us. So here, here are the timelines. Um, again, today's the, the launch of the program. On uh, January 24th, we're gonna ask for all proposals to be submitted to us for evaluation. Um, and on uh, February 21st, the, we'll have a panel of judges make a selection of the top number of um, four or five that we get from the proposals that come in to uh, actually come in and pitch those to the judges. Their, their proposals uh, and, and the, the select, selection of two from that will be made for the top two winners. 
Um, and it's not going to be just about your idea, but you've got to have, a, as we'll show you in a minute, a complete idea in terms of what the application is, is, is accomplishing. If there's an ROI to it somehow, uh, we'd like to have that in it. But more importantly is, do you have a development team that we believe, and you can convince us, is capable of delivering this uh, uh, prototype within six months? And that, that'll be key to one of the selections of, of um, these proposals as a winner. So it's the best, best ideas with the best teams behind them to make it happen. And then um, once, once we've made the, the choice, of, we'll, on February 28th, we'll announce the uh, uh, winners, and they'll have a uh, press release made and, and uh, checks submitted, uh, I mean proposed uh, for you to get. Uh, and the way it works is, is you get half of the $10,000 for getting accepted as one of the winners, and you get the second five thousand dollars when you show a working prototype, and um, so that's the the schedule that we have, and all the prototypes will be done somewhere in the August thirty first time frame. We just call us and schedule a time for us to get together and look at it, and then uh, we'll we'll grant you the second half of your your winnings. So when you submit your your proposal, um, what is your application idea? <coughs> kind of a diagram of the functionality of the application, if you can do that. Um, and they explain how the application would meet the, meet the requirements of, low, of uh, high, high bandwidth, gigabit to bandwidth, and low, low latency, uh, and, and or uses software-defined network in your application. Um, and then what are some of the benefits of your application to society or whoever you, is targeted to be uh, focused at? And if there's an ROI involved, uh, if you think that by putting this in, for example, the streetlight application, there was power savings as part of the ROI that, uh, that they use for that particular application. Again, more, more detail on, on the, uh, the rules. Basically, um, um, get, get us your proposal by the 21st, and we'll, we'll pick some people to come in and uh, uh, give the presentations to the judges, and then they'll make the, the selection of the two winners. Now, now what we'd like to do is, uh, if at all possible, put put your demonstration up on the Genie Rack and have us uh, demonstrate it there if possible. Um, if not, we'll make other accommodations. But the goal is to have it running on the on the Genie Rack by the time you're ready to release your 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 application. Oh, where did they publish uh, last <coughs> challenge winners? Because I didn't hear anything about it. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I mean, obviously. I we had well, we had a, a, a press release went out on it. Okay, did so it go out to all of Dallas? Or? It actually came. It was picked up by several of the newspapers okay. and um, our, you know the I think the um, Dallas Morning News and also the DBJ had had uh, announcements of it. What we what we'll also do is put it up on the website, okay, that's good. so that people can see that that's a. What we're going to do is we're going to take all this information and add it to what's already up on the website now in terms of resources, information that you can go back and check on. So if there's any updates to anything, if you go to that website, you'll be able to get the latest and greatest. Okay, that's good. Okay, so this is basically it. Um, we want to open it up to questions. Anything you might have in terms of questions would be uh, available to, to answer. Uh, we encourage you to kind of network a little bit, and talk to each other. Maybe uh, last time we had some people get together that met here to, to, to want, they wanted to put a proposal together. So maybe there's things like that that can happen. Maybe you've got an idea, but you're looking for a development team to help you. Uh, if, if, if that's the case, we hope that the networking here can help you do that. Um, anybody have any questions that we haven't answered already? Okay, good. I want to thank Beth Coleman for helping us put on today's event. She's working with the, uh, the Richardson Chamber and Tech Titans group on several projects as a, as a consultant. And, uh, thank you, Beth, for what you've done today. Uh, okay, uh, the, everybody gives an idea in terms of who's here. So if you've got some ideas about networking and trying to get together to maybe think about a way to make your proposal, we appreciate it. Um, again, the, the deadline is the 24th of January. We're going to have all this information up on the website. There's a link here on the uh, page that you have that you can always go to the website and check what's going on. 
pick up the information. If you've got any specific questions, send them to me, and I'll get you an answer if I can. If not, I'll send it to somebody else that I know that could give you an answer. Um, and I guess I'll just make the, the, the point. If anybody else has any questions, please come forward. We're going to be around here for a few more minutes so you can do some networking and discussions. If you want to have one-on-one, -on -one, come on up. So thank you very much for coming today. Uh, happy holidays, and I wish you a nice, prosperous 2018. Thank you.